Now that we've discussed what muscles look like and the structures inside of the muscle cell, let's talk about how muscles actually contract. So contraction is again going to be this activation of cross bridges between the myosin, the thick filaments, and the actin, the thin filaments, that's going to generate force and cause the muscle fiber to shorten. This is going to end when the cross bridges stop being formed. In sliding filament model of contraction, the idea is that neither the short filaments nor the thin filaments actually change length, they just move past each other. That's why it's called sliding filament. So in a relaxed state, the thin filaments and thick filaments slightly overlap, and then during contraction, Cross bridges form between the actin and the myosin, and the myosin is actually going to pull the actin past it, and then it's going to slide past, and that's going to overall shorten the length of the sarcomere. Here you can see the distance between the z-discs has gotten shorter in the contracted state, and that's going to multiply it across all of the sarcomeres, across all of the myofibrils, across all of the muscle fibers in a muscle, cause muscle contraction. So at the sarcomere, what's going to happen is that when the muscle cell becomes stimulated by the nerve cell, and we get that action potential that's eventually going to trigger the release of calcium, we are going to cause these myosin heads to grab onto the actin filaments forming the cross bridges and then it's going to actually pull it and these cross bridges are going to be uh, formed and broken over and over and over again kind of if you were pulling a rope hand over hand in order to pull someone up uh, like I don't know they were dangling off the side of a ship or a cliff and you were pulling someone up the rope doesn't get shorter, right? But the person moves towards you. So during contraction, these head groups are going to grab onto the actin filaments and pull them, sliding the actin filaments over them. The Z discs are going to get moved towards the M line. Our I bands, the lighter bands of the striations, get shorter. The Z discs move closer together. We completely get rid of the H zones. And our A bands move closer together. And overall, the length of our muscle shortens or contracts. So here, let's look at some micrographs. So here is a relaxed sarcomere of a muscle fiber. You can see here we have the half I band. Here we have the A band. Here we have this H zone with the M line down the middle. We have only thin filaments in the I bands. We have a mixture of thin and thick filaments in the A band. When we contract, you can see that these I bands get much, much shorter, and these Z discs end up moving closer together. Z disc moves, moves towards M line, Z disc moves towards M line, and you can see that these I bands get much shorter. And overall, the whole length of the sarcomere and the whole length of the muscle gets shorter because these thin filaments are sliding past the thick filaments, and the whole thing just sort of gets compressed together even though neither filament changes in length. This muscle fiber contraction is going to be triggered by the action of neurons in the case of skeletal muscles, and this is going to start in the central nervous system, usually in the brain. Every once in a while we get what's called a spinal reflex that's going to occur just in the spine. But usually we have this conscious decision to move that is generated in the brain that's going to be transmitted down the spinal cord to what are called motor neurons that are then going to activate the muscle fibers. 
both neurons and muscle cells are excitable cells that are capable of these action potentials. And these action potentials are these waves of depolarization, this change of the voltage across the cell membrane, that is going to send a signal very quickly across the whole cell. The signal is going to actually move from the neuron to the skeletal muscle, not as an electrical signal. It's actually going to move as a chemical signal that takes the form of the release of a neurotransmitter uh, called acetylcholine, ACH. Note that this is not a typo. It is capital A, capital C, lowercase h, acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter, the chemical released by the neuron, that's going to trigger contraction in the skeletal muscle cell. And this signal is going to cause a change in the electrical properties across the cell membrane. And so that's going to involve the movement of ions. And remember, ions are charged particles. They cannot move directly across the cell membrane because we have these hydrophobic tail groups that are going to block them. So instead, we need a membrane protein. This is where all of those membrane proteins that we talked about before when we talked about the cell, these are going to come into play now. So remember when we talked about ion channels, we talked that ion channels can be both what are called chemically gated and voltage gated. Chemically gated ion channels open up when we receive a chemical signal like a neurotransmitter, like acetylcholine. Voltage gated ion channels are going to open up when there's a change in the electrical properties across the cell membrane, um, i.e. when we get an action potential. So these chemically gated ion channels are going to open up when the neurotransmitter is released. This is needed in order to start the action potential, start what's called the depolarization of the cell. Voltage-gated ion channels open up once the cell has been sufficiently depolarized, reaches what we call threshold, and then that is going to spread the action potential across the whole cell. So chemically gated ion channels are needed to start the action potential, and then voltage gated ion channels are going to spread the action potential across the cell, and that's what's going to trigger the release of calcium, which is going to trigger muscle contraction. Some things to remember about the cell. Remember we have the sodium potassium ATPase, aka the sodium potassium pump, that's going to be constantly pumping sodium out of the cell and potassium inside of the cell. So sodium is at a high concentration outside of the cell, potassium is at a high concentration inside of the cell. The resting membrane potential of the cell is negative. In the case of muscle fibers, it's at about negative 90 millivolts. Sodium, as you can tell from this little plus sign, is positive. So if we open up sodium channels, which way is sodium going to go? It's going to go inside of the cell. We have two forces very strongly pushing sodium inside of the cell. One, sodium is at a high concentration outside of the cell. So remember, um, things are going to diffuse along their concentration gradients. So sodium is going to go from where it's at a high concentration outside of the cell to where it's at a low concentration inside of the cell. Uh, substances are also going to be attracted to opposite charges. So the positively charged sodium is going to be attracted to the negatively charged internal environment of the cell. So when the sodium channels open, we have two forces, what we call an electrochemical gradient, forcing sodium into the cell. Now, what effect is sodium going to have on the charge of the cell? Sodium is positively charged. 
the inside of the cell is negatively charged. Positive charges cancel out negative charges. So when that sodium flows inside of the cell, the cell is going to get less negative, what we call depolarized. So the opening up of sodium channel is going to cause sodium to go into the cell, and that's going to depolarize the cell. And we have two ways of causing that to happen, chemically gated ion channels that are going to open up when neurotransmitter is uh, attached to them, and voltage gated ion channels that are going to open up once the cell gets sufficiently depolarized. What's going to trigger this whole thing is going to be signals from what are called somatic motor neurons. And these somatic motor neurons, these are going to send those voluntary signals to control skeletal muscles. And these signals get sent along these long thread-like extensions of the cell called uh, axons. So axons are part of individual neuron cells. A neuron is a cell. Um, in contrast, a nerve is going to be a bundle of a bunch of cells, but an axon is going to be a part of one particular cell. However, this axon can branch and split apart and actually what's called innervate multiple muscles. So innervation is when we have this attachment between an axon of a motor neuron and a muscle fiber. And this is going to occur at a structure called the neuromuscular junction. So each muscle fiber has one neuromuscular junction with one motor neuron. Let's look at this neuromuscular junction. So at the neuromuscular junction, this is going to be what we call a synapse. And a synapse is a connection between a neuron, a nerve cell, and its target cell which in this case is the muscle cell. This is going to allow us to send the signal from the neuron to the muscle cell. And this is going to be through the release of neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, into this little tiny itsy bitsy. It's tiny, about as small as a space can be in the body, called a synaptic cleft. So we have these axon terminals, which are going to be these widened, flattened ends of the axons that are going to be separated from the muscle fiber by just this tiny little space called a synaptic cleft. Within the axon terminal, we are going to have these synaptic vesicles, and these synaptic vesicles are going to be full of acetylcholine. When the signal to release acetylcholine happens, it's going to cause these vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane of the axon and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And that is going to then bind to the acetylcholine receptors, which are chemically gated ion channels on these junctional folds. Uh, which are going to increase the surface area at the neuromuscular junction in order to allow us to send these signals really efficiently. Okay, So we have at the neuromuscular junction an axon terminal full of synaptic vesicles filled with acetylcholine, which gets released into the synaptic cleft, this little space, and then that acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors on these junctional folds, and that is what's going to trigger the influx of sodium, which is going to start the depolarization of the cell.